after, right around that time. They moved here, what, about a year and a half ago? Two years ago? Uh, Vin, Vin is a, a really interesting uh, guy. I almost said character, but I, that could be considered. <laughs> I, 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 I say that in a good way. All of my best friends, I say they have characters. I, 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 and I hope to be a character myself. Um, so I say that in a good way. What's that? A success. Achieving a lot. Good. Um, so I say that in a very endearing way. I think Vin is, is a great character in the space. and. Uh, my, one of my favorite things about Ben, ben is he, he has a very, very interesting philosophy about uh, human nature, and everybody has sort of their superpower, and I think Ben, because he's had a very interesting background, he's lived all over, done neat stuff, he's been in Vegas, and uh, one of his superpowers is sort of understanding human psychology, and he's a student of, of, you know, how people think and how history works and religion and these kind of things. He actually, and, and, and I had some, I've, I've defended him a couple times on Twitter, not defended, but, but verified on Twitter a couple times, that when he was here a year and a half ago, he predicted exactly what was going to happen. I mean, that's just one data point that, at least if you believe that I'm telling the truth, there's one data point that he predicted exactly what was going to happen. He said, we were sitting right out here, and he said, I think that you're going to have Bitcoin split into two Bitcoins, and then uh, this Craig Wright character, who a lot of people haven't, haven't really heard of, is going to really use this name and use the Satoshi thing, and then people are not going to like him, and that's going to break off, and he's going to break into another coin, which will be an offshoot of the, of the other coin. He predicted it exactly, exactly right, so that, uh, and he had some pretty good reasons. So when he said it before, I said, that sounds pretty smart and pretty interesting, and then as it unfolded exactly as it was, so, um, so that's just one interesting data point, and there's a lot of other interesting things. So I'm really glad to hear uh, what Ben has to say, and uh, without further ado, thanks a lot, Ben, for being here. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, guys. Yeah, I've gotten the moniker over the years, Ben Stradamus, and I think that I've, I think I've come by it uh, honestly. So yeah, if you want to do hashtag Ben Stradamus, I tend to put these things on Twitter, and you can go through and be like, oh, he actually did that. So I'm not even trying to brag. It is just kind of a weird thing that I'm able to do. Um, so this is going to be like a Ben Stradamus thing, and this is totally boring, right? Security tokens on Bitcoin Cash. I guarantee you this is not going to be boring. I guarantee you that by the end of this, uh, you will either be very angry at me for uh, introducing some ideas and putting them, putting a little brain worm in there about Bitcoin, or you're going to be uh, very, very happy and interested, and I hope that it's the latter, because then we can do some positive things. So I just want to do a little experiment first. Um, how many people have a Bitcoin or Bitcoin-related wallet on their, whether you have a balance or not, wallet on their phone right now? Raise your hands. Okay, pretty good, most everybody. Keep them up, keep them up, hold on. Yeah, I'm gonna wear your hands out. Um, of those people, how many people have sent or received funds? Keep your hands up, hands up. Okay, of those... minutes ago. Okay, good, excellent. Of those people, if I said the term uh, pay to public key hash, how many of you, keep your hands up if you could explain to me what that term means. Pay to public key hash, you, you would know. Keep your hand, so probably, these are all the developers, these are all, all developers. Uh, keep your hands up if you are not a developer. And you can still explain to me what, put your hand down. If you are not a developer, but you could still explain to me what, pay to public key hash, one person. Okay, excellent, excellent. So if, if any of you have, I'm not going to go into pay to public key hash, but what I'm trying to illustrate here is that there are things going on with Bitcoin, and we have a lot of people in the space who will try to tell you what Bitcoin is and what Bitcoin isn't, and I think that that's very good, but we've all used this technology, we've sent and received, if you sent and received what you've done is you probably, most likely, 99.9%, .9 you've done a uh, pay to public key hash transaction. I'm not going to go into what that is, but what I'm going to illustrate is that if you don't know what that is, probably a chance that you don't actually have a really good idea of what, what Bitcoin is. And so we say it's money. I've been saying lately it is not money. I don't think that that's so. You can call it money. 
You can pretend that it's money, and all money is pretend. Anyway, I mean, the $100 bill in my pocket, I mean, we're all pretending that that's actually worth more than the paper that's printed on. So, all, so you can pretend that Bitcoin is money, but I'm, I'm going to present to you another idea, and this is an idea that I haven't really seen put into the space. I think the people who actually know what pay to public key hash is and the developers here will probably, uh, after this, they can maybe you can argue about this, but I think that most people, most of them will say, okay, it's a crude, it's a crude approximation. It's a working model. It's maybe a stick, as a stick figure is to a human being. That you look at it and you're like, okay, yeah, if you wanted to represent it that way. But yet, it's something that I haven't really seen presented as a model, and I think that it will enable us to change what we perceive Bitcoin to be and start to work through what the future uh, could look like. So if you want to go next slide. This is Bitcoin. This is Bitcoin that I work with every day. And I would say most developers as well. It's a, and we, this is pretty straightforward. It's a lockbox with a depository slot. This is your address. Now it's not, the money is here. This is Bitcoin. This is the network, this is your address. That's the value, that's the money. Okay, so start off with this, locked up, that's your address. Your address is a lock, by the way. I don't know if you know that. That's what your address actually is, it's a lock. And you can send to an address, you put it in and then it's locked behind this lock. And then you use your key, literally your key, and you do an unlocking script, and you unlock it. Now with Bitcoin, the thing is you unlock it and you immediately have to put it back into another one. It's gotta happen at the same time. Unlock, relock, okay? But it's not the money. It's not the money. The money is the value that we put in. And so what I'm gonna talk about today and what's interesting is what else could we put in there? But you could put some money in your lockbox, in your safe deposit box, but you don't only have to put money in your safe deposit box. Put all kinds of different things in your safe deposit box, but it's the same process. Bitcoin can put all those things in. You can put a representation of money, you can put a representation of gold. Actually just did that today. There's some gentlemen in here who've got a representation of gold on the Bitcoin blockchain, and it moved just the same way as Bitcoin. What else can you put? How about these? These have gone in safe deposit boxes for hundreds of years. Maybe, the, maybe thousands of years, really. We really want to talk about the, the earliest inclination of saying, I have a share of this enterprise. And we know how to create these, this GM. This is an old one, this is 1955. It's not like we, have, we don't know and have the processes for creating, and what is this? It's pretend again, we're just pretending. There's no, this, this, this is not actually a piece of a company. This is a piece of paper that we're pretending and we've agreed, and that's what Bitcoin is about. Bitcoin is a consensus mechanism that we can all agree that, yeah, that's what this stands for. So let's go to the next thing here. So, what I'm gonna talk about is ways for things other than money to be put onto the blockchain. And there are several protocols. There's completely other um, blockchains that do this. There's several people representing those that are in here. But I think that we haven't actually fully played out Bitcoin's ability to just do it with Bitcoin. Now, this is something that, that made Vitalik sort of angry, that people didn't want to think about this. There's not a technical hurdle to it. It's just that there's a lack of mind share about actually doing it. So uh, we have some protocols. One of the protocols that is incredibly powerful and that uh, actually represents, I think now, probably a systemic risk and may end up taking down the whole entire, uh, the whole enti entire market is uh, you've got $2 billion worth of Tether. That's on the Omni protocol. How many people know that half of Tether. How many people know that Tether does not have a blockchain? All right. Tether is not its own blockchain. When you go on CoinMarketCap and you see Tether, I think it's number four now, that's, that's, it doesn't have its own blockchain, right? Half of Tether 
are Bitcoin transactions. You all knew that, right? It's, it's just Bitcoin. It's just Bitcoin. And the other half is Ethereum. And it was all Bitcoin until uh, the fall of 2017 when the fees went up. Because the exchanges were getting crushed. Every time that they were trying to move Tether around, they were having to pay Bitcoin fees. It's just Bitcoin. The fourth, if just Bitcoin and just Ethereum, right? If you were to separate it and just take the Bitcoin, it would be the seventh cryptocurrency. Seventh largest market cap cryptocurrency. Just Bitcoin. So we already know that you can put that there's value on the BTC blockchain that is not the BTC-based token. Because I can move a million, million dollars worth of Tether for 546 Satoshis. Which is nothing. What is it, cent? Something like that? Might be a lot someday. It might be a lot someday, but it will never, ever be as much as I can put, because I can always, I could put the entire, if we all agree, I could put a trillion dollars into that 546 Satoshis, or I could put a cent. So it's very, so that's different. And this is not theory. This is happening now, right now. And it's, it's having a massive effect on the entire ecosystem. So, I work on Bitcoin Cash. I left in the fork with BTC. One of the reasons why, I'm an entrepreneur. CTO of Cointext, um, right now contracting, uh, building out some infrastructure for Bitcoin.com to be able to do this. High fees. Very, very simple if you're an entrepreneur and you have a choice of doing the same thing for the same amount of revenue and on one side the cost if i use this product the cost is nothing and if i use this product the cost is more than i can charge for the service you know, it's not about ideology it's not about anything like that it's very very simple and it's simply i'm an entrepreneur that's how i put food on the table i have children i have a family very easy decision. Call me a shit coiner, that's perfectly fine. My family's eating and we're uh, you know, living very comfortably and I'm able to work on Bitcoin all day. So I'm happy with that. So uh, recently, uh, basically in the last year, we've had the SLP protocol, which is based, it's on Bitcoin Cash. It is, I would say, an improvement on the Omni protocol, which Tether is based on. You already have a stable coin, uh, honest coin, which is on there. Spice token, which was interesting. That came up as like a little tipping token. And then somehow it got a price. It was kind of like Bitcoin Pizza Day, where everybody was trading around these, and do, I'll tip you a million spice. It wasn't worth anything. And then all of a sudden, OK Exchange was like, we'll trade it. And it got a price. And all of these content people and people on Telegram were like, oh my god, selling it for uh, BCH. So that's actually interesting to watch the sort of analog of Bitcoin's history, of being just something for fun. Um, what's in interesting about it, it's been around for a year. Uh, how many people have ever used an SLP token? Few people? Yeah, they're pretty cool. They move just like BCH, just like BCH, because they are. Um, and they're just a, there's an additional little memo field, you could say. And it's that memo field that you agree that, oh, this is worth something different than the Bitcoin. There's, uh, but it can do a lot of, I won't get into all of these. The most important is these tokens are super easy to create. Even for non-technical users, you could go on and create one right now. Um, Roger Beer has done several videos. It's like easy way to create SLP tokens. It takes five minutes. Anyone can create them. That's really good for what we're talking about, about creating other forms of value. It's gotta be easy. You gotta be able to just print these things off. Uh, go next one. So these are the exchanges that are already trading this. But the reason, excuse me, the reason why I'm showing this is um, this is an emergent phenomenon. Like these things are happening in the space all by themselves. It's not being planned out. And it's very important that we watch as emergent phenomena happen. This was not an ICO that did this. This was not somebody's idea. There is an SLP white paper but it was people picking it up and thinking that it's a good idea. One interesting thing about the SLP white paper was it was written right before the uh, BCH, BSV hash war and split. And if you look at the co-authors, it's basically like the top names on both sides. So it was something that everybody kind of agreed upon that this was, the, this was a move to make. 
and it's been very easy. People have picked it up. Uh, you can go next. One interesting thing, and this is already being used, this is a project that I worked on uh, with Bitcoin.com. They brought me on to do the uh, BIP70 portion of this. The S this, is in, this is really, really interesting that this is already being used. So dividends, super important. If you've got shareholders, you need to pay them a portion of your profits. Super important. You can go to tools.bitcoin.com, you can check this out for yourself. Uh, create a token, send it to a few of your friends. You can look at the entire blockchain and you can see who owns what share of this token. And then you can choose on a pro rata basis to send them funds right to that address. Because again, it's the same address. So it's a BCH address, you can send it right to them. Which is something that the ICOs didn't offer, by the way. That's actually really, really important. Like we had this problem with the ICOs and the biggest problem was you didn't get a piece of the company. The idea was just, well, this token will go up in value and that'll be good enough. Like we'll do good things and then everybody will want the token as like very like underpants gnomes, you know what I mean? <laughs> it's a very underpants gnomey thing. This is like, if you've got the token, you're gonna get paid. And the most interesting part that's really fun, do this with the Bitcoin.com wallet, then go check it on the blockchain. Uh, you, the Bitcoin.com wallet using BIP70, which is very, very important, uh, you can generate hundreds or thousands of outputs. So, you, so what you could technically have is you could have somebody go to your store. This is the part that I, this is what I think is like the coolest thing about Bitcoin. I think this is really what gives it its value. Go to the store. Let's say we, we are all part owners of some store. And literally the person as they pay can pay all of us and the light bill and the manager and taxes and the landlord in one transaction. Not it goes to a business and then the business disperses it. But literally as they pay for bread, each of us gets our piece. And the piece that goes back to get the next loaf of bread and pay for it. Super interesting and a very different way of doing business. I'll, I'll, I'll get to questions again, don't worry, hold on to it. Okay, keep going. So I'm gonna just quickly, I'm gonna blow through these security tokens. The reason why I'm gonna do this, I'm an anarchist, okay? I'm not about, this is not about uh, obeying the government, right? But I'm also an agorist, and I'm also a father. And my children rely on me not being in prison. And I've had my fair, I've done my activism, and I've had my fair share of running with governments, local and otherwise, and that I'm not afraid of that. But it's also, when you're an entrepreneur, it's a reasonable risk. Reasonable risk. And so I'm gonna run through a protocol that uh, myself and uh, Dave Burson, who some of you may have met, if you were around for the last couple of days, he, um, he's our counsel for my company, Cointex, and he and I have been working through these things for the better part of a year. He's not an anarchist, uh, which is good <laughs> to have around when you are, so he keeps us on the level. And so what I'm gonna go over is I'm gonna go over a protocol for actually doing the issuance of stocks on Bitcoin Cash using SLP in a way that is legal, in a way that is not an ICO, and that can be done for a small company like when we started up Cointex and we had to put together our securities offering, get our investors on board, have our capitalization tables, do all of the, the things that the SEC needed us to do and stay within the law. So that, look, you protect your investors, you protect yourself, and what I would like to see in this space is I would like to see real businesses that are sustainable, that are building real things, and I don't want to go through the ICO bullshit again. And quite honestly, if we're gonna bring real capital in, it's gonna, we're gonna need to do it, to start, we're gonna need to do it with some level of legitimacy that this capital will understand. And as things move on, and as we become the investors, then we can make some different decisions about what we wanna do. But we gotta start with the transition. So, that's why I've got this. People know, anybody uh, who's dealt with New York when it comes to crypto knows that it's a real pain, but I think that this is pretty good. Frank, I think Frank got it right. If you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. 
So let's start with the most adversarial. Let's build that. And if we can make it there, then it's no problem if we want to launch a Zimbabwe company, right? It's not going to be a big deal. So go ahead, I'll blow through these because we don't need to get into the legal and technical. First thing is, I am not a lawyer, but this has all been checked and developed by my attorney. But this is not legal advice. Please seek out an attorney if you're actually going to do this. Okay. So bottom line is, if you're, if you're thinking that you're just going to issue tokens that are potentially securities, uh, no, no. Uh, you, you, you can try. You can try. Don't count on your business surviving. And if somebody is offering you this, they're either dumb or it's a scam because their business isn't going to survive. You're not going to get a return. You can go next. Um, so when we're talking about doing an offering, usually a small company that's starting up is going to use one of the SEC's exemptions, which is going to make it so that they don't have to do full filing and, and sort of a full registration with the SEC. There's a lot of these different exemptions, but what you'll notice on these things is that there are limits on every single one of them. Very things that you could do. It's basically limits on whether an investor is accredited or not accredited, um, how many investors you have, how much investment total you're getting, um, and if you go, well, we've also got, okay, go to the next one here. Um, so, this is, this is pretty important. Um, federal exemptions from security reg registration requirements for equity securities. Generally, if you're a company that has more than $10 million in assets and uh, 2,000 or more um, equity security holders or 500 or more non-accredited security holders, you can't do this. But this covers like, most companies fall way inside that. And especially a, a Bitcoin startup, a crypto startup is gonna fall way inside that. And so this is what your offering is going to be anyway, if you're going to be starting a company, go ahead. Most important part of this, and this is where Bitcoin comes in, this is where the model that I started with about the, the lock and the key and the, the, the lock box is really important. And I think that this is a place where uh, we can actually provide some advantage over the traditional system, where code is not law, guys, but you can use code to uh, follow the law. Let's just put it like that. You've got restrictions on selling these securities. Stocks is what we're talking about, folks. Equity in a company. There's restrictions under all of these different rules when you're using those exemptions. Um, basically, again, it comes down to whether it's private or public, whether you're selling to an accredited investor or a non-accredited investor, and then based on those things, for the most part, um, it's a time restriction. Either generally either a year, 90 days, or in the case of the most qualified buyer, there's no time restriction. But that's actually really important because if you mess that up, which is very easy to do if you've got a permissionless token, you know, selling this, you, how do you prevent somebody from selling something that's in their possession, that's non-custodial, they have the keys, they can move it. Like, how would I stop you from moving your Bitcoin, right? So if we're going to do this, we need to start thinking, what are the things that Bitcoin can, can do to maybe help us with this? Go next. So some real obvious things, some things that we don't really generally use unless we're doing a, more advanced things that honestly and unfortunately don't actually really happen a lot in Bitcoin. And I think one of the reasons they don't happen is because we've been running around saying, Bitcoin is money, Bitcoin is money, Bitcoin is money. Well, there's only a few things that you can do with money. And we just stop thinking when we're like, Bitcoin is money. Okay, well, I know the things that I can do with money, but if I say Bitcoin is a lockbox, he starts to think, oh, okay, okay. Let's think a little differently. There's some things that we can do with the lock, like a time lock. That's not like something strange. We know that. We know that there are certain vaults that'll only open in between this time and this time, or multiple keys, right? Different combinations, secret words, past phrases. These are old technologies for locks. And that's actually what Bitcoin does. So time lock. We could time lock for a year. We could time lock for 90 days. Multi-signature, we get back here, right? An issuer can decide 
So you're, you're a stockholder, but you've also got the issuer who's the company. And they say, okay, I'm gonna take a look at this transaction. What's the transaction you wanna do here? Well, I wanna do this, and I wanna send it to this address. And this person who's got this address says, well, this is me, I hate KYC, but it's gonna keep you legal. And they say, well, this is me, we'll prove it's you. Here's a message. They sign it. It's Bitcoin. It's built right in. Nobody's talked about this, and yet it's the perfect application. Perfect. And every wallet can do it right now. Every wallet actually does all of these things. Nobody's using it. Trillion dollars. Trillion dollars. Private equity companies. Trillions. Right? Could we bring it onto the chain? We've got two billion in tether on BTC. That's just two billion. What if we brought this value on? What if the value, the representation of all of these companies was on there, which is already ready to go? So look at the things that you can do. Sign off on uh, accredited investor, public or private sale, total number of investors. Why? Because I can see the total number of addresses that are holding. I can keep a record. It's a distributed ledger. There it is. And uh, so we've got multi-sig on all the uh, Bitcoin um, variants, if you will, and more. What's interesting is that we also on Bitcoin Cash, one of the things, one of the new op codes that I really like is called OpCheck Data Sig, something that's been talked about for a long time. Uh, very, very useful, which basically allows like a blind sign. Traditional multi-sig, you're gonna, the only thing that you can sign is the transaction, so the other signatory actually needs to see the transaction. But this allows them to, it allows you to put in an arbitrary message that they can sign. So it allows them to do a blind sign off, and then you can basically, as the second signature, you can do it at your leisure. They say, okay, yeah, it's fine. You're fine to sell this now, here you go. It's basically a release. It's, sign, it's a sign off, a release of this. Kind of like, um, what's the best uh, real world example? Signing off title like a paint slip, like your car. You know, you sign, you sign it off at the bottom and you're like, okay, yeah, 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 I sell it. It's gone, you don't need to take that to the DMV. So go, go ahead next. Um, okay, this is where it starts to get really, really interesting. Uh, we, we need to get some business models for making this happen. So we wanna move businesses onto the blockchain, but I'm not one who's a big fan of saying what, although I think it's important, the vision for what blockchain can do, what it may do in the future, what it can do. Not really helpful for me as an entrepreneur. What's helpful for me as an entrepreneur is for you to tell me how I can make some money right now. It's like, build this company, this is what the company looks like, you're gonna make money in three years, I take that, I go and I sell it to an investor. That's what's useful for me. So I'm gonna try to make that useful as well, and hopefully you guys think about it, and hopefully you wanna go build a business. We're missing that in Bitcoin, I think. And by the way, even if you're not technical, this is exactly the type of thing for you to think about if you want to make money, not speculating, but if you want to make real money, right? Coinbase doesn't care what the price is. They make money on either side, coming and going. BitPay doesn't care what the price is. They make money on either side, coming and going. You want to make money on either side, coming and going? I do. No, I mean I do. That's what I mean, I do. Not I want to, I do. Because I, because I don't think Bitcoin is money. That's why. So, most important thing about Bitcoin, I think, this is for me, these are the projects that I'm working on. Um, it's a business model that I started with my company, Cointex, as sort of a proof of concept that this could be done. I call it non-custodial financial services. You'll hear it talked about a lot more. Actually, Roger Beer used the term, he just gave the a keynote, actually on these dividends at the CC Forum, he used the term there. It's super important, it's something Bitcoin can do that no other money can do. And as it turns out, SEC and FINRA just said, we're real interested in this. Uh, July, joint staff statement on broker-dealer custody of digital asset securities. They said, uh, in this, they said, uh, generally speaking, non-custodial activities involving digital asset securities do not raise the same level of concern among the staffs, provided that the relevant securities laws and other legal and regulatory requirements are followed. But there's just not 
If they're not talking about the blockchain here, I'm not exactly sure how you facilitate this and make any money. It's, it, to, to break down custodial versus non-custodial for you, the entire financial system is custodial. Entire financial system as it currently exists. What does that mean? You give your money to somebody, and then fundamentally you order them to do something with your money. A lot of order instruments. The check is a traditional order instrument, but so is your card. When you put your card in and you do your pin, what you're doing is you're authorizing and ordering, hey, move my money from here to there. Well, not your, we want to call it your money, right? Move some money that you're pretending belongs to me from here to there. And I say pretending because, you know, God forbid a fee comes in or order from the government that says, oh yeah, you need to send that over to us. Whether it's legit or not, it's gone. So what we can do in Bitcoin, because of, as I was explaining the, these multiple outputs and this idea that the guy pays for bread and he pays for all of us, that's non-custodial. That's a non-custodial business model for financial services. So that means you can offer literally anything, any financial service, including, well, why don't we help you put together your transaction to move, to do that sign off, to do this exchange, to match two people together. You want to buy these shares, he wants to sell these shares. And give us an output. Give us an additional output. We're not going to take custody of the shares. It's going to be yours. So they said a broker dealer instructs the customer to pay the issuer directly, so pay the company directly. And then he tells the company to uh, send the security to the customer. That's really weird to do and really hard to make money at if you're not using Bitcoin. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Like People are going to look at that and be like, what in the traditional industry? A broker dealer facilitates over-the-counter secondary market transactions uh, without taking custody of or exercising control over the digital asset securities. Traditional financial market, they're like, if I don't have control, how do I make sure I get, I get paid? Like if, if he doesn't give me some money or something, how do I make sure that, that I get paid? But with Bitcoin, we can do it. Uh, alternative trading system. This is really what we need to start building. And for people who are uh, involved in the broker-dealer business, so Bruce, I, I don't know where he's at, but I hope that he uh, watches this. Uh, oh, there he is, good. <laughs> yes. This is. This is uh, where we need to be going, um, and there are some, some ways of doing this. Uh, so an alternative trading system, basically what we need to create is we need to be able to create a market that's something like atomic swaps, the idea of an atomic swap, uh, with, a, with a matching party in between, right? who can match them up and get an additional output as their payment. And this can be done in the current broker-dealer model. Um, nobody, has, nobody has done this, um, but they're already saying, we want to take a look at this. We think this is interesting, and you're going to have a lot less scrutiny if you try to do this. The other interesting part about this non-custodial financial service model is you're at, you, you can actually take more. You can actually make more, because you reduce the cost of the custodian, but the market for the service will still hold the same amount. So if you're competing with a custodian, they have all these additional costs. If you have to hold on to some of this money, you have incredible cost and incredible risk because you have a fiduciary duty to the person who's the depositor. If I don't hold on to any of your money, but I just provide the end service, well, I've just reduced my cost greatly, but I can keep my rate for revenue at the same as my competitors. So you see where that goes. That's just very, very clear business. Well, let's go to the next here. Okay, so and that's what it would look like. Most important thing, taking a fee as an additional output in a sale or a resale transaction. I've talked about all of these things, and I'll, I'll share this online as well, these slides. So if you, if you do want more information about this, uh, some people met Dave Burson, uh, blockchainlawguide.com. I would advise anybody who's just going to start a business that's going to deal with cryptocurrency to, in any way, to go ahead and go check out blockchainlawguide.com. Uh, this is a, maintained by Dave Burson, who is absolutely um, obsessed with this stuff. And it's, it's got to be the best resource out there that has aggregated everything. And he comes to conferences like this, he interacts with people, 
uh, he's got the knowledge at the forefront. And one of the things that I can say just as a sort of endorsement of him, we were lucky that we found him very early on in us building Cointex uh, because he's so well versed in the money transmitter laws. I mean, super well versed. And they are, how can we say this? They're incredibly illogical. When you actually understand what is going on within these laws and, and um, what FinCEN, which is the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, why they consider, let's say, a Bitcoin vending machine slash ATM, why they consider that to be a money transmitter, it's, it's goofy. It's goofy, and it has nothing to do with money, actually. Nothing. And it's not what you would think it is. But he really helped us, and we were able to develop our product from the beginning so that we were able to avoid all of those things. And I would like to see people doing that more rather than, I, I get the idea of not asking for permission, but you can't ask for forgiveness from these agencies. Okay? The, oh, sorry, that's not, my bad, doesn't work. These guys don't care. But what you can do is have a very, law is, and then like I say, code is not law, but your code is code. And if you could show that code, and you could show your terms of service, and you could show the structure of your business, and you, and you have good representation, and you can show that your code is within the law, then you don't have to ask for forgiveness. So that takes a little bit of preparation up front. So I would advise anybody who's doing that just to take the stress away, man, to not worry about it. That's, that's your other offset, right? That's a security measure. Because the biggest threat to your security is always the government, period. And the biggest threat to your money is always the government. All right, so you can go to the next. I'm, I'm not sure, okay. So that's the end of my talk. I hope that, I hope that you think differently about uh, what Bitcoin is. We all, I mean, we know that it's a lock. I found that interesting, that there's like a, a, a chain with a lock going around this thing. We, kind of, we know these things. We sort of have them in the back of our mind, these, these, these archetypes, they bubble up. And I think that, I think, my Vinstradamus prediction is that we've got 24 months of the current paradigm. And within 24 months, this tether thing is going to, to do something to the space that is, that we don't quite understand what the ramifications will be. But when we come out of it, I think that, I hope what we come out of it with is not tether is terrible, I hope what we come out of it with is Tether was an emergent phenomenon. I hope what we come out of it from is Tether is, is Bitcoin. Like, Tether was built on Bitcoin. Tether is, bit, is something you can do with Bitcoin. Tether UTXOs are Bitcoin UTXOs. Just because we didn't see it, right? Just because you didn't pay attention to the cancer doesn't mean that the cancer wasn't from your body and your actions and your environment. And that's what I think we're about to see. And so what I hope is that we can start thinking, because we're gonna survive this, right? Some of us will decide that we no longer want to participate. But those of us who, who do, and I believe this is a multi-generational project, right? And, I, and I've said many, many times that I don't think that what this thing's final form is will be seen probably even by my grandchildren. It's money. It's money, and it's a new form, it's not money. It's a new form, what it is, is it's a new form of, of value transfer that we've never seen. And so the thing, after 10 years, that we can start to be like, oh yeah, this is what it's gonna do. Imagine that. Imagine 700 BC, right? And they stamp the first gold coin. And the king looks at it, he's like, this will be uh, international digital uh, it'll be moving, ac uh, moving across borders. This will, yeah, come on. That's where we're at. Let's not try to predict. Let's just try to build. Let's look at where we're at and try to take the next step forward. Yes, there's something on the horizon, but I guarantee you none of us know what the hell that is. And we don't know how many detours we're going to take along the way. Right? So this is another framework. Again, it can be money if you want it to be. I think you'll make a lot more actual money if you stop thinking that it is, and you start thinking, well, what can I do with this? How can this change the world that we currently live in? So that's my talk. If you have any questions, somebody had a question, but if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them.
Oh, plenty of time. Good, good, good. Um, it seems a little backwards to me to go for the most, the hardest thing first. It's like, usually with startups, it's like MVP, you know? It's like, what is the absolute crappiest thing I can make that will like do something desirable? So what, what is the strategy there? Like why go from like so extreme when you can start in a really crappy place and prove out that people people even care about what you're doing? Uh, you know. I actually think that's a that's a really good question. And so I would I would reframe it a little bit and say maybe I have mispresented it if that's the way that this has been presented. Because what I actually presented to you was the MVP. What I presented to you was the cheapest and easiest way that we could actually begin to do this and not bring down the federal government on your head. What, what I mean is the SEC, like, forget, forget the United States, right? Yes. Like, like obviously they're very, and New York specifically, mm -hmm. like, all, all, this is the hardest jurisdiction, so I guess I think it makes sense to go for, like, a super easy jurisdiction first. Uh, yeah, which goes back to the Sinatra quote. Right? It's, it's what Sinatra is saying there, where he says, if you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. There's kind of the, the um, I don't know if it would necessarily be a corollary, right? but I guess it is kind of what's insinuated there. That it's like, well, if you can make it as a singer in New York, and you can be a professional singer or a professional actor on Broadway, you can certainly go and be in the community theater of Wichita. No problem. Right? But if you're saying, well, bro, why would you go to New York? Right? Why, why not? Why go to New York? There's so much competition on Broadway. Why not just go to community theater in Wichita? And the reason why is because, well, then you, you're just in the community theater in Wichita. Right? But if you can build it to be compliant in New York, then you've already got every other jurisdiction covered. So it's like, it's the idea of, of build once and serve it to a million. Um, and, and the unfortunate part is that here, what you're dealing with again is you're dealing with it. I think it helps to think of it, this as a security issue, right? I think dealing with regulations for us who are technical and engineers, we don't often think about the law and, and um, the legal repercussions as a security issue, right? We think, we think about the code, we think about infrastructure, you know, we, we think adversarially, but it's always adversarial hacker. But, and you, and you know this, that attack generally, it sucks when it does happen, really. But the attack that happens is the one that you didn't plan for. That's always the attack that I was just, oh, okay. It's that deep, deep, deep bug. But this is like, not a deep bug. This is the attackers who are sitting out here saying, one wrong step. One wrong step and we got you. This is our job. This is all we do is wait for you to mess up. And so we need to start, as engineers, we can be very helpful in this space to start changing our minds a little bit and to start seeing this as a security issue. And I think that, and, and I mean, that's coming, from my libertarian side, I don't want, again, I don't want to obey the government, but I also don't want them kicking down my door. So I've got to take those security measures. And part of those security measures is just knowing the law. A lot of it, you can get around it by just simply knowing the law and saying, oh, you know what, actually, this exemption, this exemption, okay, I can do everything I need to do. Maybe I need to file two papers. You know, maybe it's gonna cost me $500 for, for my attorney to do this and I get some, some peace of mind in the mail. Okay. So that's sort of, that's, does that answer kind of the reason why? Well, what, so, and maybe this is, maybe this is unfair, but, um, and maybe this is the wrong way to think about it. I think as I've gotten older, my idealism has gone down a little bit. Uh, as I've actually had, as I've actually built businesses and had some fail and some succeed. Um, and when you're dealing with a startup, I, the one thing that I don't want to do, whenever I cut out a jurisdiction, I cut out investors, right? If I can't show a working demo to anyone in New York, do you know how much money I prevented myself from being able to attract? Because bottom line is like, that's where the money's at. And they want to see a working demo. 
And if they can't use it, if they can't show it off at cocktail parties, I know that's super cynical. That's super cynical, but that's about 90% of the raising capital from VCs, right? Do you have a toy that they can show off to their friends at cocktail parties? Seriously. <laughs> and if, if they can't do it in New York, forget that you just cut yourself. Now you're really going down to the community theater of Wichita and with your hand out asking for money for your, your crypto startup, right? Right, exactly. <laughs> Is there a, a, did you have a, talking about like a reg A, we're not talking a uh, regulation A, we're not talking about doing an IPO, we're talking about small mom and pop companies that are actually already, literally already having to deal with this. It's not like this is, this is something that companies aren't already having to do. So what we're presenting, hope, if we have it, enough scale, and this is, an, honestly, this is the issue. So um, the, the pessimistic side here is that the only way to make this really work is that it's got, there's got to be enough scale that the service that's being provided can be provided at a low enough cost that it can actually compete with the way that people are doing it now, which is generally something like, you know, for the small mom and pop, it's something like legal zoom and a few hours of an attorney figuring out how they can take some investment, right? It's gotta be cheaper than that. Right. And if you start with the cost of not going to jail, just get that out of the way. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what does that cost, right? That's, a, that's significant cost savings, yeah. Okay, so that's a good, that's a very, very good question. The, in this case, the data itself actually, just like with that stock certificate, the real data with that actually lives with the issuer. So the issuer actually has a record of who the, the registered stockholders are. My, and here I'm not, you'll hear a lot of let's put everything on the blockchain. The fact of the matter is like that, that just can't be a first step. Can't. You know, especially if you want businesses who are going to take additional funding and who already have this system set up, we're going to need to present, what we want to present to them is, look, this, this solution allows for ease, for less friction in actually moving your security, your shares of the company from you to someone else and doing the resale. Because that's actually, that's super important, right? If, if I can't uh, divest myself of a company if I can't, if the company's value goes up, I want to be able to, if, if I want to exit, I want to be able to exit. That's super important. And right now, that's a, there's a lot of friction in that process. So really what, what you're providing is you're providing that, that movement very quickly. And instead of your lawyer having to contact uh, the issuer and deal with all of the paperwork, if it's standardized, it could be a situation of, okay, this person is a whitelisted accredited investor, they want to buy a piece of your company, and it's literally an API call this way, process, look in the database, an API call that way, and then, okay, you can sign off and we can send it. So the decentralization is not, it's decentralized in that it's a series of protocols and anybody can use it. There's no central authority, per se, that's going through it, but it's not decentralized in the way that, well, the issuer is not going to have a database. The trader is not going to have a database. I don't think we're. I honestly don't think we're there. I think that's a bit of a. a I think it's a utopian vision, to be honest with you, because I don't even see any of the companies that are making money even using that. It's beautiful, you know. It's a beautiful vision, but I, I, I don't think it's really realistic. <laughs>
big evolution of smaller companies raising capital via blockchain protocols. So to totally, I think I think you're spot on. I just um, I guess I would I would say that while no one's doing it this way, I do think there are big big moves coming soon to make this happen. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree. There's no question that, I mean, we just did a security side table. So there's no question that incredible capital is being invested. My suggestion here and why, what the idea that I'm trying to suggest is, like if we look at the established players who are going out and purchasing these ATSs and doing this, they're gonna use a custodial model. They're already custodial. Right? They're gonna use a custodial model. And I don't know, does anybody in here have those deep pockets to be able to go and go through the regulation for the custodians, uh, I think that that's been done, right? So I'm not particularly interested in presenting ideas to people that would require them to be already established players in the financial industry. What I'm interested in presenting ideas to people is here's how you could start a small business very cheaply with, some, with your typical tech level of investment. And, and make a real splash and actually potentially compete with these guys. And really compete with them because your cost has been significantly lower than theirs. Right? And this is an opportunity not just for blockchain uh, and crypto startups, but also for some, uh, some broker dealers, who smaller ATSs who want to be able to compete in this space. Yeah, I think maybe like you create a pipeline where like, you know, your, your legal Zoom one-off, that's like, hey, you wanna, like, we have it all set. Here's the lawyer. Here's here's the ATS. Here people are here's the group of investors that understand this. You know, done. That's <laughs> right. That would be the way, probably. This is and that's it. I'm not gonna do it. But somebody, right. <laughs> somebody please do it. Right. Somebody, you do it. <laughs> so uh, I think is that is that time? Or, okay. Well, thank you guys very much. It's great. Thank you. Thanks a lot.